After Jurassic Park became such a phenomenal success, it was only a matter of time that more would follow. With more than $916 million in ticket sales and home video records being smashed like a T-Rex breaking its way through a downed tree, it wasn't a question of if Jurassic Park would get a sequel, but when. In 1995, although initially reluctant to write a sequel, Michael Crichton released The Lost World, the sequel to Jurassic Park. Shortly after, Steven Spielberg and Jurassic Park screenwriter David Kep signed on to write and direct a sequel respectively, taking plot elements from Crichton's second novel but doing their own story. And in 1997, there were rumours that something had survived. Hello, it's Dumo again, and today I'm going to talk about what, for me, was the second coming of Christ in 1997. The Lost World Jurassic Park. With more dinosaurs, more action, and more daddy, The Lost World was the sequel that said, OK, we know you can do dinosaurs, but what can you do with them? I'll be looking at the screenplay to The Lost World, examining the story synopsis and structure, themes, characterizations, dialogue, and more, looking at how the film was received upon its release, its impact, legacy, and my own personal thoughts. Once again, we'll be looking at the final edit of the film as the final version of the screenplay. Let's take a deep dive into the Lost World Jurassic Park. Just like in Jurassic Park, and most movies to be honest, we open with the hook, the first scene designed to grab the audience's attention and kickstart the main plot. We open with... growling? No, it's just the ocean. We fade up over an island. Not Isla Nublar, though. The text tells us that this is Isla Sorna, 87 miles southwest of Isla Nublar. Gotcha. We see some raging surf before revealing a yacht owned by a luxuriously rich British family called the Bowmans. They have decided to take a jolly on Isla Sorna, which, for them, involves reading the Financial Times, probably, and barking orders at the help while their possibly human daughter, Kathy, tries to escape the reach of her overbearing mother, Deirdre. We have a name for these kind of people in the UK. Tories. Kathy receives a sandwich from the help while her mother, Deirdre, derides her for potentially ruining her appetite. They're serving prawns, her favourite. Now, darling, don't wander off. While Kathy seeks freedom from Deirdre's controlling nature, Deirdre worries about snakes. There aren't any snakes on the beach. Really, pal? Deirdre lets her go and realises she doesn't know how to work a bottle of champagne. Edward! Yes, ma'am. Kathy makes her way down the beach, having a grand old time by herself until we realise she isn't alone. The bush rattles and out pops a Compsognathus, one of the new dinosaurs in this film. The compie is particularly interested in Kathy's sandwich. Kathy obliges, giving the creature a bite of roast beef, which it's into. Kathy calls excitedly to her parents before realising that the rest of the flock has gathered around her, now no longer interested in the roast beef. Lunch is served and Deirdre calls out to Kathy. Lunch is definitely on the compie's minds alright. They close in around Kathy, deciding that she herself looks like the better option. Kathy screams, catching the attention of her father, who considers that this might just be worth lowering the copy of his paper. Paul senses that something might just be wrong and runs to Kathy's side. Deirdre screams at the help to run faster as they round the corner and she looks upon the scene. She screams. <coughs> Cut to Daddy. Once again, played by Jeff Goldblum. He's not on a beach, but rather a subway, standing in front of a sign that shows a beach-like setting. Malcolm is the protagonist of this film and will be following his journey this time. He steps onto the subway car and sits down. Many things have changed since the last film, and we're about to see to what extent. Some jackhole recognises Malcolm and snaps his fingers to get his attention. Rude. The jackhole walks over and sits down next to Malcolm, who busies himself by looking into his copy of the always reputable National Enquirer. The jackhole tells Malcolm he recognises him. From TV. And he believed him. <laughs> Malcolm tries to ignore him while other subway users sneak a peek at him. There is a deleted scene that the film was originally meant to transition to before this one. In the scene, Peter Ludlow, John Hammond's nephew, is presenting pictures of the injured Kathy Bowman to the InGen board members. 
He tells them that the Bowmans are suing the company for Caffey's injuries, but they're used to that by now. He then goes on to list how much each of the deaths in the first film cost the company, as well as the disposal of Isla Nublar resources. This scene was deleted and is not considered to be canon, but for one brief moment, there was a scene that confirmed the destruction of Isla Nublar, both organic and inorganic. That means that just like the book, they destroyed the park and the dinosaurs. No more Rexy, no more Brachiosaurus, no Jurassic World or subsequent films. This scene remains on the cunning room floor and thus is not canon. The most important thing to note in the deleted scene is this. Wrongful death settlements, partial list. Family of Donald Gennaro, $36.5 million. Family of John Arnold, $23 million. Family of Robert Muldoon, $12.6 million. Muldoon's family only got $12 million while Gennaro's got three times as much? Why? Because he was killed by Rexy? We all know what that almighty bitch did to Muldoon. She eviscerated him. You're telling me that only gets 12.5 million? Get to fuck. Anyway, the real point of this scene is to show that Ludlow doesn't give a fuck about his uncle, describing him as a born again naturalist. Ludlow pulls the old vote of no confidence act and gets the other board members to back his ploy to oust Hammond as CEO of InGen. Supplanting himself in his stead, he's ready to take over the company's significant product assets. In the actual canon, Malcolm arrives at the mansion of none other than John Hammond, where he is greeted by Hammond's butler. The butler almost tells him to GTFO before Malcolm tells him that he was summoned by Hammond. Malcolm enters Hammond's mansion, finding it a little bit creepy. To his joy, Lex and Tim come down the stairs, making their cameo appearance in this film. The slightly older kids say their hello to Malcolm. He welcomes them, despite having jack shit to do with their survival in the last film. He asks them if everything is okay, setting the scene for the coming confrontation. Peter Ludlow makes his way down the stairs, accompanied by lawyers like he's leaving a funeral. Unlike Jurassic Park, The Lost World actually has a human antagonist, in the form of Ludlow, InGen's new CEO and actual bastard, played by Arliss Howard. Ludlow and Malcolm trade verbal spars, with Malcolm accusing him of covering up the events of the first park, along with ruining his career and reputation. Ludlow states that Ian broke his non-disclosure agreement and went public about the events of the first film, despite the fact that they offered him generous compensation for Rexy absolutely fucking him up. Malcolm says that InGen can't keep twisting the truth, which triggers Ludlow and leads him to say that InGen is his responsibility now as he is CEO, not his uncle. He tells Malcolm that everything will soon be made clear and his problems will disappear. He leaves, with Malcolm trying to get the last word. Ludlow pulls the elitist card and tells Malcolm that his suit costs more than Malcolm's entire education. Arsehole. We then come to the inciting incident as Ian meets John Hammond again, played by Richard Attenborough. The last four years haven't been kind to John, as he is now mostly bedridden. He begins by telling Malcolm he was right. Thank God for side B. Hammond admits that Isla Nublar was a sham, a smokescreen for the tourists, and that behind the curtain, there was a second island where the dinosaurs were secretly bred, raised, and transported later over to Isla Nublar. Told you Hammond being there for the birth of every dinosaur was bullshit. Shortly after the events of Jurassic Park, another hurricane hit Isla Sorna and wiped out their facility, forcing InGen out and causing the dinosaurs to be released out of containment. Apparently, they never factored in hurricanes when they were planning this whole venture. The dinosaurs have survived on the island, living in the wild, and Hammond has kept the whole thing a secret and away from public eyes. Malcolm reels from the news. 1. There's a second goddamn island with goddamn dinosaurs. 2. They're still alive, despite failsafes like the lysine contingency that was meant to ensure they would die in a week without supplemental enzymes. Hammond tells him he's organising a team to go to the island and document the dinosaurs. A small team, very low-key, in and out before the dinosaurs even notice them. Aye, right. Malcolm tells him he's off his nut and asks what four idiots he managed to convince to go on a suicide mission. Hammond admits he had to pay most of them handsomely, being cagey on the identity of the paleontologist, and asks Malcolm if he'll be the fourth person. InGen has been on the verge of bankruptcy since the events of the first park and have wanted to exploit Site B to recoup profits. Hammond has been able to keep them at bay, but the Bowman's recent venture onto the island and Caffey's subsequent injuries have been the final straw for the board and they've forced control of the company away from him. InGen is going in sooner or later and Hammond believes that if the world sees the dinosaurs in their natural habitat, public opinion will be strong enough to convince the company to leave them alone. He needs Malcolm to do this. 
Malcolm immediately says no, refusing the call, and decides to contact the other doomed members to stop them from going. That is, until Hammond reveals that the fourth member, the paleontologist, is Malcolm's new squeeze, Dr. Sarah Harding. Oh, and she's already on the island. Malcolm is devastated as John tries to reassure him, saying that Sarah insisted on going in first and that she'll be fine. She's used to studying African predators, so she's well experienced for the job. Malcolm tells him to stop getting people killed for his own legacy. He decides that the research group is now a rescue team and they're leaving right now to get Sarah. Hammond takes this as a win. The plot is set in motion by the inciting incident. The question posed, will Malcolm go to Isla Sorna to help Hammond? Absolutely not. Will he go to Isla Sorna when he learns his girlfriend is there alone? Oh, Jesus Christ, okay. Malcolm meets the group's field tech, Eddie Carr, played by Richard Schiff, a sarcastic arse and a man after my own heart. Eddie says he's nowhere near ready as Malcolm struggles with his satellite phone, trying to contact Sarah. We get some exposition that Sarah is a tech head and is already suggesting improvements to Eddie on his kit, which he loves. Malcolm takes his frustrations out on the satellite phone as the videographer Nick Van Owen shows up, played by Vince Vaughn, fresh off of his success in the film Swingers. Malcolm introduces himself and asks for Nick's CV, which includes documenting wars and hanging out at Greenpeace to get his hold. In an interesting juxtaposition to his character in the first film, Malcolm actually disapproves of this. Nick doesn't really care, he's there to get paid, describing the venture as a wild goose chase. Uh, where you're going is the only place in the world where the geese chase you. Malcolm's daughter Kelly shows up, played by Vanessa Lee Chester. She's excited to hang out with her dad. Yeah, about that. Kelly is less than thrilled when she learns that her dad is buggering off and lumbering her with a Karen. Heh. She'd rather stay with Sarah, lol. Malcolm tries to convince her and they argue back and forth about Malcolm not being present enough or being enough of a father to her. He barely does anything, even tell her off. Ultimately, she just wants his attention. He doesn't even know that she got cut from the school's gymnastics team. But we do. Remember that Chekhov's gun. She begs him to come along, but he refuses, for obvious reasons. She drops a brutal jab at him, ironically getting the angry rise she was talking about. Seeing her in tears, Malcolm apologises for being a deadbeat dad, telling her not to listen to him, which she takes literally. Eddie and Malcolm examine the high hide a device meant to observe the animals from height that doubles as a Rex version of Just Eat. While they bicker about Malcolm's new time schedule, Kelly takes a gander at the rest of the tech, climbing aboard the field trailer and looking around, impressed. She looks at a map of their destination, Isla Sorna, as we transition to their boat arriving at the island. They park in an ominous and misty lagoon as Malcolm steals himself. Eddie shows him his Lindstrad air rifle, a god mode gun capable of taking down anything in one hit. Nick talks with their captain, Carlos, who refuses to take them any further up the river. Apparently, people who go too close to Sorna don't come back. Makes sense. Carlos says they can contact him via radio, but he won't wait around, describing the islands as Los Cinco Muertes, the Five Deaths. A name explained in the novel, but never really in the film, unless you count it as Five Ways to Die. In which case, that number is incredibly low for Isla Sorna. Malcolm, Nick and Eddie drive into the island and begin their search for Sarah. They track her using a GPS Eddie built into her satellite phone, with Malcolm getting anxious and snippy. They reach the location and rush over, finding Sarah's tattered pack and satellite phone. Panicked, Malcolm begins calling for her. Sarah! 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 Sarah Harding! How many Sarahs do you think are on this island? Sarah Harding! Sorry, I'm just trying to help. Unsurprisingly, shouting in the jungle starts to attract attention as something big moves through the trees. A herd of stegosaurs emerges in front of them, astounding Nick and Eddie. Nick starts snapping pictures while Eddie goes through a holy shit dinosaurs moment. Malcolm's seen it all before. Nick climbs onto a log to get a better shot, not noticing Sarah standing off to his side, played by Julianne Moore. Sarah notices him and calls out, causing him to shite himself. She climbs up the log to see Ian, and is amazed that he actually came. She runs up in full nerd mode as she expo dumps about how she's been following the stego herd and monitoring their nurturing habits. Malcolm shows her her pack, asking if she was attacked. Oh no, that's my lucky pack. That's how it always looks. Before he can go any further, Sarah asks to borrow Nick's camera and sets off again after the stegosaurs. 
Malcolm and the others follow her, with Malcolm asking her why she never told him that Hammond contacted her. Because I knew you would have stopped me from coming. I would have tied you to the bed. Makes sense. Sarah's worked out the lysine problem too. Turns out the herbivores eat lysine-rich foods and the carnivores eat them. Circle of life, really. InGen really never fought any of this shit through. Sarah tells him to stay back as she goes in closer, much to Malcolm's chagrin. She approaches a baby stegosaurus and takes a picture. Unable to resist, she reaches out and touches it, experiencing the wonder of touching an actual dinosaur. Again, Malcolm, and us, have seen it all before. He comments about how she can never resist touching things, while Malcolm and Eddie are still in holy shit dinos mode. Sarah reaches the end of Nick's film and the tape rewinds, startling the baby stego. Now you see kids, before everything went digital, we had to use something called film to take pictures, and when the film ran out, it would reset back to the start. We also had to get the pictures developed. Fucking kids getting everything handed to them instantly these days. Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, the baby stego shites itself at the noise and calls out to its parents, who go on the offensive. Nick holds Ian back, who tells Eddie to shoot them. Eddie says they're just protecting their baby and won't shoot them for that in cold blood. Sarah dodges around the stegos as they nearly kill her, diving into a log and barely missing their tail spikes. They then flee with the baby as Malcolm and the others rush over to Sarah. As they head back to the trailer, Nick and Eddie are still on a high. Sarah tells Nick not to light a cigarette as it could draw other dinos and they can't interact with the environment, despite the fact that she just did. A bit hypocritical, but I guess it was a really cute stegosaur. Malcolm tells her it's impossible not to affect the local wildlife while they study it, and Sarah says she'll take the risk. She's fed up digging around in the dirt, and this is also partly Ian's fault, as he told her all about the events of the first island. She says she knows what she's doing around predators, including him. Nick and Eddie discover a fire at the base as Sarah states her modus operandi. She wants to prove that dinosaurs were good parents, particularly Rex's, who some other asshole paleontologist Robert Burke has been trash-talking. They are drawn by Eddie's calls of a fire and discover it was started by Kelly, who has stowed away on the trailer and just wanted to make dinner. Malcolm berates her for hiding in the trailer while Nick and Eddie try to work out why she's black. Do you see any family resemblance here? Oh my god guys, you can't just ask someone why they're not white. Sarah is impressed that Kelly hid in the trailer, much to Malcolm's annoyance. Malcolm tries to get Eddie's sat phone to work again, beating it in the process. Violence and technology? Not good bedfellow. Malcolm decides to use the radio in the trailer, offering anyone who wants it a chance to leave. Sarah ignores it, briefing Nick and Eddie on how to act on the island. Malcolm offers to send last messages for them as he drags Kelly inside the trailer, telling her to clean up her own mess, and unable to remember how to work a radio. Sarah joins him to try and calm him down. She says she appreciates that he came all this way for her, but she's not leaving. She's going to get the job done. Malcolm says she's going to get herself killed as a rumbling begins. Seeing several helicopters approach, Malcolm thinks their rescue party has arrived and tries to get their attention. Eddie notices that the choppers say InGen, and instead of a rescue party, it's actually the first act turning point. Malcolm looks at the choppers through the wrong end of the binoculars as we see a second team arriving, geared up with jeeps. The first act ends. Malcolm has entered the new world, Isla Sorna, and found Sarah. He wants to leave ASAP. Sarah doesn't, and now to complicate matters, Kelly has stowed away with them, and a second team is arriving on the island with a different agenda. The second act begins with Ludlow leading his team of mercenaries onto the island, saying to set up camp right there. Reveal Roland Tembo, gentleman, philosopher, and hunter extraordinaire, played by the late Pete Possifway, who tells him that's a shit idea. He says this is a carnivore hunting ground and asserts dominance over Ludlow, telling him he doesn't give a shit what he thinks, he's in charge, or it's Dita. All Ludlow needs to do is sign the checks and he'll forgo his fee as long as he gets to hunt one of the tyrannosaurs. The buck. If Ludlow doesn't like it, Roland is out and he can go fuck himself and get everyone killed. Ludlow has only one response. Okay! There's another deleted scene that I should talk about that actually sets Roland's character up earlier in the film. In the original introduction, Roland is sitting at a bar in Mombasa when his longtime friend, Ajay Sidhu, played by Harvey Jason in Brownface, approaches him. He tries to recruit Roland to Ludlow's upcoming venture, but Roland declines, saying he's seen it all before and there's nothing left for him to do. He and Ajay were too good at killing things and it's left him melancholic. Such a tragedy. 
He then beats the shit out of a bad tourist who's harassing a woman before returning to Ajay, asking him what kind of quarry he thinks could possibly be of any interest to him. It's an interesting scene as it sets up Roland's character and his mindset. I'll talk more about his characterization later, but I do think it was a good scene that I wish had been kept in. I guess they took it out for pacing reasons. The hunters tear up the game trail, not giving a shit about Sarah's don't bend a blade of grass philosophy. They cause a stampede of panicking dinosaurs, and Ludlow has his own holy shit dinos moment. The roundup begins, with Roland using alternative names for the dinosaurs as he doesn't speak nerd. A pachycephalosaurus is separated from the main stampede and the hunters close in. We are introduced to the InGen group's paleontologist, that asshole Sarah name dropped earlier, Robert Burke. Played by Thomas F. Duffy, Burke is modelled after real-life paleontologist Robert Backer, a rival to the Jurassic Films paleontological advisor and, according to allegations, real-life sex pest Jack Horner. Burke gives one of the mercenaries and the audience a rundown on the pachycephalosaur, describing its tough dome skull, which it then demonstrates by giving one of the cars a Glasgow kiss. Burke and his companion GTFO as the other hunters close around the pachycephalosaur, lassoing it and shooting it with a trank dart. Malcolm and his group gather on the ridge and watch as the hunters target a Parasaurolophus. Dieter Stark, Roland's second in command, shoots the para and the hunters encircle it. It proves difficult to bring down, until they rip its legs out from under it. Malcolm's group looks on anguished. We can be so mean. In the aftermath, Roland and Ajay examine a giant footprint on the ground. Roland asks Burke to identify it. It's a Rex. Roland gears up, ignoring Ludlow as he sets off to collect his fee. It's at this point we get a proper introduction to Roland's number two man, Dieter Stark, played by Peter Stormari. He refreshes himself as a compi comes up to investigate him. Burke comes over excitedly and examines the creature, saying they are primarily thought to be scavengers. Dieter notices it doesn't seem to have any fear. Burke says that as no humans have been on the island before, there's no reason for it to be afraid. Dieter decides to give it something to fear, shocking it with a cattle prod. Arsehole. Roland and Ajay find the Rex nest. Mum and Dad are out, leaving a single baby alone in the nest, chowing down on the remains of some unfortunate dinosaur. Roland deduces that the parents could return at any moment. Ajay suggests waiting, but Roland says that won't work. This is their home. Instead, they need to make the buck come to them. We then cut to the baby Rex tethered to a stake in the ground, howling in pain. Its legs been broken. Roland and Ajay sit camouflaged in a tree, waiting for the parents to come looking for it. You could be forgiven for thinking that Roland is the one that broke the baby Rex's leg with the way this cut plays out. But actually, it wasn't him at all. It was Ludlow. In a deleted scene, Ludlow shows up drunk as they tether the baby Rex. Something running in the bush startles him and he falls backwards onto it, breaking its leg. There's also another version of the scene in an older draft, where the baby headbutts Ludlow and he breaks its leg in anger. This scene should have been kept in the final film. For the life of me, I can't understand why they took it out. I assume for pacing, but it changes the perceptions of the characters and undermines events that happen later in the climax. Every piece of tie-in media in 1997 featured this scene, from the comics to the junior novelizations, and it's in both drafts of the screenplay. I've always assumed that Roland was looking back at the camp, angry at Ludlow in this scene. But it's not in the film, and while no one says Roland broke its leg, it's an easy assumption for the audience to make. Of all the scenes taken out of this film, this is the one that I wish had stayed in the most. Malcolm and the others spy on the hunter's camp from an overlook, with Sarah becoming dizzy from the height. Malcolm realises that NGen are planning to take the dinosaurs off the island back to the mainland. Eddie has technology envy. Nick confirms that Hammond knew this group were on their way and provided an insurance plan. Nick himself, saboteur extraordinaire. Ludlow makes a satellite call to the InGen board members and potential investors, pitching him his vision along with two compies. Ludlow's been at the whiskey and makes what he thinks is a great joke. Software is already fully developed. One might say it'd been up and running. <laughs> Maybe no more for him, eh? Nick and Sarah infiltrate the engine camp and find a captive Stegosaurus. They set it free. Ludlow continues his pitch, telling the board members and investors that they're going to bring the dinosaurs back to San Diego to add to the city's already bustling attractions. San Diego Zoo, SeaWorld, San Diego Chargers. Taxi for Ludlow. 
Nick and Sarah set more dinosaurs free, including the baby Stegosaurus from earlier. They approach a caged Triceratops, bracing themselves. Ludlow reaches the climax of his pitch, Jurassic Park San Diego, using an amphitheatre that was Hammond's original idea that he then abandoned. Deciding he will finish his uncle's work, he tells the investors the park could be completed in less than a month. LOL. The trike fucks shit up as the other dinosaurs run amok. Dieter can only stand and watch as the camp goes up in flames. Roland and Daje jump out of their tree to avoid a flaming car that has gained the ability to fly. Nick finds Junior and, realising he's injured, removes the stake. Roland returns to the camp and fires Dieter. That's the last time I leave you in charge. Haha, <laughs> arsehole. Sarah waits anxiously by the car as Nick returns carrying Junior. Sarah says this is a bad idea, but Nick says they have to help him. Dieter finds a broken padlock and Roland realises they're not alone. Malcolm and Kelly return to the trailer to once again try and radio their boat for pickup. Eddie is at the high hide as Nick and Sarah drive past, with Junior howling louder than the machine. Malcolm gets a wrong number and tries to talk to a confused woman as Nick and Sarah arrive with Junior. They bring him inside with Malcolm deriding their decisions. No, no, honey, no. Nick and Sarah examine Junior, with Sarah deciding that they need to set his broken leg or else he's fucked. Malcolm struggles to find Carlos as Kelly puts two and two together and realises she needs to GTFO. Malcolm takes her to the high hide. The high hide rises up to the treetops as Kelly becomes self-aware. So stupid, I'm so stupid, I should have come along with you, I'm so stupid. Nick and Sarah get to work on Junior, sedating him. Malcolm tries to calm Kelly, telling her that this is the safest place for her and that they'll be fine. With impeccable timing, the Rexes roar into the night. I guess they've returned to the nest and are now looking for Junior. Malcolm calls the trailer to warn Sarah and Nick, but Sarah patches him, forcing Malcolm to head back against Kelly's wishes. He descends to the ground. Personally, I would have squeezed just a little bit harder. Sarah finishes setting a cast to Junior's leg, using Nick's gum to secure it. Junior trips out on the operating table. Eddie and Kelly watch as the Rexes thunder through the jungle, heading towards the trailer. Eddie tries to call them, but Sarah offers him a paddle to go along with a fresh dinghy. Malcolm arrives back, saying that they need to get Junior to fuck. Too late. They watch as the car is kicked over the cliff into the sea below. They look through the window as Mummy, the doe, looks in behind them. She's not alone though, and the buck appears at the other window, startling them. Two Rexes for the price of one. Three, if you count Junior. The Rexes examine the trailer and coo at Junior. The buck roars, leading to a great shot of Sarah. Sarah realises they've come for Junior, and Malcolm is more than happy to oblige them. They open the door and give Junior back to the buck. Malcolm finally answers the fucking phone as Eddie tells him the Rexes are fucking off back to the jungle. Relieved, the three take a moment, with Malcolm all but saying, I told you so. Sarah decides that the parenting habits of the Rexes are now academic. Malcolm goes to Radio Carlos when he sees something worrying. Hang on, this is gonna be bad. Deciding to give them a parting gift, the Rexes absolutely fuck up the trailers, pushing them towards the cliff. The door is jammed, preventing them from getting out. The Rexes push the back half of the trailers off the cliff, suspending it in midair. Deciding that's enough for now, they fuck off properly. Ian, Sarah and Nick hold on in the hanging compartment before the fridge breaks and Sarah falls down onto the glass window. Mind how she's scared of heights? Don't move! Aye, I don't think that's a problem mate, she's fucking petrified. Malcolm climbs down to her as Nick reaches for the rapidly sliding satellite phone. Malcolm tells Sarah to grab his hand as the phone falls, smashing its way through the glass. Malcolm uses Sarah's lucky pack to reach her and she hangs on, now with nothing between her and the raging surf. Your lucky pack! Eddie hauls ass back to the trailers. Malcolm and Nick lift Sarah back inside as he arrives to help. He checks out the damage and climbs inside. Rob, what, oh, anything else? Yeah, three double cheeseburgers with everything. No onions on mine! I Mine's a double quarter pounder with cheese, no onions or gherkins. Eddie actually laughs at this, the absolute legend that he is, and gets to work. He secures a rope around a tree and throws it to the others, right as the trailer begins to slide over the cliff. This is definitely a crisis. Eddie runs back to the car, winching the cable to the grill of the trailer. 
Or at least, he tries to. He and Sarah and Nick make their way up the rope, but it slips loose from the tree, sending them back to the bottom of the trailer. Eddie tries again to winch the car to the trailer, succeeding this time. He fixes the rope while he's at it because he's that much of a top fucking guy. Eddie races back to the car and guns it in reverse. Behold the power of the bands! Using that fine-tuned German engineering, he begins to pull the trailer back over the cliff. It's starting to look good. He might actually pull this off. Sarah gets some serious rope burn. Things are looking good, until the Rexes remember this is the midpoint and close in around Eddie. They examine him and we get a call back to the eye shot in the first film. Determined not to let his friends die, Eddie continues gunning the car, which aggravates the buck and the doe. They decide to remodel his car, proving more efficient than German engineering. Eddie tries to grab the god mode rifle, but it's stuck in the meshing of the seat. The buck rips him from the car, and together, they give him what I consider to be the coolest death in the entire franchise. This is for you, Eddie. I'm not actually going to pour alcohol onto the floor of my spare room. I'm not going to waste the product. I will drink it, though. With nothing to stop them, the trailers fall over the cliff, along with Eddie's now destroyed car. Sarah climbs up, where she is greeted by Roland. Hesitantly, she takes his hand. Nick and Ian are helped up by the rest of the InGen group, who have picked up Kelly en route. Both groups take stock at the InGen camp. They're fucked. All of their communications are down, and now they have no way of radioing for a way off the island. Tensions are high. Then we're stuck here, ladies and gentlemen, and stuck together, thanks to you people. Dieter wants a square go, and Nick obliges. Roland recognises him from Earth first, and they argue before Sarah warns him of the bigger picture. By moving Junior into their camps, they've changed the Rex's territory. Even Burke agrees, saying that's why they had to come back to finish the trailers. Realising they need to GTFO, Ludlow suggests they head to the InGen worker village. Turns out Hammond ran everything on geothermal power like a hippie, and thus the communication systems should still be working. There's one problem though, and it's not just Ludlow's alcoholism. The communication centre is deep within Velociraptor territory. Burke gives us and Dieter a refresher on how dangerous the raptors can be. Sarah says the Rexes will probably be on their trail too, which Burke disagrees with. No, no, you're wrong there, Dr. Harding. We'll lose them once we leave their territory. No, don't bet on it. Tyrannosaurus got the largest proportional olfactory cavity of any creature in the fossil record with the exception of one. Ludlow can't handle nerd talk and suggests they make a move. Malcolm recommends a lagoon, but they all agree Carlos is too smart just to come by, and Roland suggests that they move now as the Rexes currently aren't hungry. Malcolm tells him to press F to pay respects for Eddie, but Roland says fuck that. Saddle up, let's get this movable feast underway. Both teams, now forced to work together, trek through the jungle. Nick catches up to Roland, asking him why he's so insistent on killing the buck. Roland tells him the story of some madman. TLDR? It's the ultimate hunt for him. A worthy foe. Malcolm and Ludlow trade barbs over their ventures, with Ludlow going for a low blow by mentioning Eddie. Malcolm tells him he'll never be John Hammond, and that taking the animals off the island is a terrible idea. And uh, I'm gonna be there when you learn that. Don sees our combined group continuing on. Roland notices the blood from Sarah's shirt and calls a five minute break. He asks if she's injured, with her telling him it's Junior's blood and it won't dry in the humidity. Roland goes off with Ludlow, leaving his gun unattended. Nick sees an opportunity to fuck with him. Dieter decides he needs to take a shite and heads off into the jungle, telling Carter to wait for him. Unfortunately, he's wearing a very old version of noise-cancelling headphones and didn't hear him. Oh well. Dieter gets down to business when he hears a noise. That compy from before gives him a jump scare. Dieter pays it back by shocking it again, like an arsehole boss to an employee. He makes his way back to the group, but finds himself turned around. He calls out to Carter, who obviously can't hear him. He continues wandering and falls down a slope, losing his gun and landing roughly on the ground. The compies decide to unionise and seize the means of his ass. They swarm him, giving him a list of their demands. He manages to shake them off, throwing some stones to scatter them, and continues on. Roland picks up his rifle and tells the group to get moving. One of the mercs tells Carter, who joins them, not noticing Dieter's pack. Now thoroughly lost, Dieter walks down a stream, pursued by the proletariat. He falls over and they attack again, thoroughly savaging him. He shakes them off again, but they're not letting up this time. Now he feels the fear. 
He climbs over a log to escape and they follow, giving him a death he fully deserves. The stream runs red with his blood. Noticing his departure, Roland quizzes Carter. He takes two others to look for him, telling the group to continue to the ridge and wait for them. Ludlow tries to rally the troops with as much effectiveness of your da trying to sell a package of Avon. Ironically, it's Nick who gets them moving. RJ worries about Roland. That night, Ludlow has passed out. Pished again. The rest of the group are sleeping on the ground, thoroughly exhausted. RJ is still awake, waiting for Roland, and gets up upon his return. Malcolm asks if they found Dieter. Just the parts they didn't like. Lol. On his travels, Roland happened to spot the operations centre, which is closer than they think. He'll let them sleep another hour before the final push. Kelly and Sarah sleep in a tent erected for them by the engine group. <laughs> and they say chivalry is dead. Inside, Sarah has hung up her bloody shirt to dry. Bad idea. As Malcolm heads over, he hears the thundering footsteps. We get a water vibration callback as Sarah wakes up and realises the Rexes are coming back, drawn by Junior's blood. It's been pointed out numerous times over the years that Sarah keeping the shirt with Junior's blood on it was a very bad idea, especially because she's an animal behaviouralist and should have remembered that the parents would follow the scent of the baby's blood, even after Roland points it out to her. Now God knows, I make a hell of a lot of mistakes when I should know better as well. It could be argued that she just kind of forgot that the Rexes would follow the scent of their offspring's blood. I'll cover this in more detail when we get to Sarah's characterization, but for now, the important thing to note is that the Rexes find them again. Side note, the original draft had Burke finding a dinosaur egg and thinking it would be a good idea to have a fry up, which then drew the parents to their location. Sarah quickly tries to hide any evidence of them as the buck appears at the tent. Malcolm watches in horror as he pokes his head inside and sniffs Sarah, waking Kelly. The buck finds a shirt with Junior's blood on it and sniffs it. Sarah and Kelly try to stay completely still, terrified. The buck's rummaging wakes up Carter, who absolutely shites himself and wakes up the rest of the camp. Chaos erupts and Malcolm tells everyone to stay still. No one listens and he gets knocked over as the buck rips the tent away and roars at them. Nick grabs Sarah and Kelly and they run with the rest of the engine group as the doe appears. Roland springs into action and takes a shot at her, only to realise Nick has indeed fucked with his rifle. The Ingen hunters, along with Nick, Sarah and Kelly, run down a ravine as the doe gives chase. Carter falls and is trampled by the group, and then by the doe, who carries him for three steps before he falls off, presumably with nothing left of his internal organs. Roland regroups, grabbing a trank rifle and approaches the buck, who is still back at the camp. He fires a dart. Yeah, you might need another one there, pal. Roland frantically reloads as the buck approaches him. Nick realises the futility of trying to outrun a Rex and guides Sarah and Kelly to a waterfall to hide. Burke decides he wants to get in on it as well, but he leads the doe in with him. Trapped in the waterfall, the four of them have nowhere to go as the doe tries to get at them, just out of her reach. A snake crawls down Burke's shirt, causing him to shite it and run, straight into the doe, who decides to make a double kill. Nick, Kelly and Sarah brace for her to return, but it's Malcolm that comes through next. He thanks Nick for saving them. The engine group keep running, emerging out of the jungle and into a field of long elephant grass. Clearly the more experienced hunter, Ajay tells them to stay out. Don't go into the long grass! They don't listen, and out of loyalty, he follows them, throwing his pack away. He should have trusted his instincts as several raptor heads rear out of the grass. The group continue through the field as the raptors close in from both sides like torpedoes. They start making stealth kills, taking them down one by one. The hunters notice and panic, fleeing in all directions. The raptors take them down, including Ajay who is killed off screen. Deleted scene alert, Ajay did actually have a death that was filmed but never included. In the chaos he stops running and sees a raptor coming up from a fresh kill that charges at him. He closes his eyes and awaits his fate. The previous draft even had Roland and Malcolm watching from above and Roland turns away as his friend is killed. It's a shame the scene isn't in the film and it's one of the ones I wish had been included. Ian, Sarah, Nick and Kelly enter the field, following the trail of the engine group. Nick stops, finding Ajay's bag. They hear the screams of the dying hunters and the growl of the velociraptors. Go. As fast as you can. Fortunately, the raptors are too preoccupied chowing down and barely even snap at them as they run past. They reach the tree line and fall down a slope to the engine compound, where Malcolm hurts his ankle. Nick volunteers to go ahead as time is of the essence and Sarah and Kelly stay with Ian. 
Nick runs into the village and reaches the abandoned operations centre. You'd expect at this point, with a character running off alone, that he'd be jumped straight away, but luckily, nothing comes at him. He does shite himself at a mural of Jurassic Park and Rexy, but otherwise he's okay. He enters the communications centre and powers it up, radioing for help. Someone responds, and Nick sends out an SOS. Ludlow emerges from his hiding spot, dripping water. He spots Roland sitting with the trank rifle, while the buck snores in the background. He won. Malcolm, Sarah and Kelly enter the worker village looking for Nick. They call out to him with no avail. Suddenly, a raptor jumps on the car and onto Sarah, tearing into her incredibly lucky pack. The raptor tears the pack away, giving her a chance to escape. Malcolm distracts the raptor, while Sarah and Kelly hide in a shed with two more raptors in pursuit. Malcolm runs into another building and holds the door closed against the raptor. LOL. Raptor gymnastics are very much on display. He shields himself with a door, which doesn't really do much. He runs into a car, managing to buy himself some time as the raptor drills away at the glass. Sarah and Kelly watch the raptors try to dig their way into the shed. They try to get out the back door and start digging their own way out. Malcolm watches anxiously as the raptor gets closer. Sarah and Kelly manage to dig faster than the raptors and start to make their way out. Go! Where do I go when I'm out? I'm right back. Psych! Left with no other option, they start climbing up. Malcolm's raptor clears away the glass at the window. Noticing the shed door is now unraptored, he makes his escape, running to join the others, only to find himself cornered. He climbs up as it follows him. Remember how Kelly said she did gymnastics? Well, now she puts it into practice, jumping onto a pipe and yeeting the raptor out of the window where it gets impaled. Yeah, that's a little bit silly, but it's not the most silly thing this franchise is ever going to produce. Hey! Eyes on me! Don't worry, we'll get to that. Eventually. Malcolm questions the competency of the school's judging panel as the second raptor comes in through the hole in the back door. Meh. <laughs> Malcolm and Kelly run as Sarah climbs onto the roof with the raptor in pursuit. She jumps onto the next roof and it easily follows her. I bet the raptors would have made the gymnastics team. The other raptor appears below and jumps at her, snapping at her legs. Sarah gets an idea and uses the Spanish tiles on the roof to cause the raptor to slide down onto the other one, where they start a squared go. She tries to climb up but falls down herself. Fortunately, the raptors are too busy getting wide with each other and she makes her graceful escape. Malcolm and Kelly find her as a rescue chopper arrives and they race to the landing pad, catching up with Nick. They run up to the roof with Malcolm asking if they are the only survivors. Coming! The helicopter takes off. The group take a breather, with Kelly clearly traumatised. Nick reveals Roland's bullets that he took from his rifle, dropping them on the floor. Unfortunately, Roland was able to improvise, and as reinforcements drop in, we find him sitting next to the sedated and caged buck, while Ludlow orders the capture of the baby. He congratulates Roland, saying that he single-handedly saved the company. Roland doesn't care. Ajay is dead. His friend is gone. Ludlow offers him a job at Jurassic Park San Diego, but Roland declines. He's done. He's had enough. I believe I've spent enough time in the company of death. With what he has left, he just walks away. Sarah sees them from the chopper and opens it, revealing to Malcolm and Nick the second act turning point. The characters have escaped the island, Nick stopped Roland from killing the buck, but now it's been captured and it's on its way back to the mainland. It may as well have been for nothing. So much death has happened already and it's still not over. They failed. The helicopter flies into the third act, bringing us to San Diego. The third act actually changed in between drafts because Spielberg wanted to go in a different direction and pay homage to the original The Lost World. The original draft of the film had a longer raptor sequence at the worker village, with Roland and Ludlow going after the buck. There was also another character in Malcolm's group called Dr. Judson, based on the character Levine from the novel. The finale included the helicopters landing in a pteranodon nest and a fight with them involving the raptors. Certain events with Ludlow and Roland played out in the same way, with Roland letting the buck take the victory and Ludlow… well… no spoilers for what's coming next. Lol, this movie is over 25 years old. There is a flurry of activity at the NGEN dock as board members and the press gather to witness Ludlow's grand unveiling. Malcolm and Sarah show up too, having had a quick shower and a shave. They are denied entry. Ludlow prepares to christen Jurassic Park San Diego with a mega attraction as the harbour master arrives, saying that the ship is here ahead of schedule. Ludlow clocks Malcolm and Sarah. You see that lost looking couple of Sir, you need to look at this. 
Let them see this up close. Yes, sir, Mr. Ludlow. Ludlow sees the ship approaching as the harbour master tries to hail it. There's no response. Lol, King Kong reference. It keeps approaching at full speed. Ludlow steps outside and runs as the ship crashes into the dock. Not a great start for his grand unveiling. Ludlow, Malcolm, Sarah and the rest of the NGEN employees board the boat, finding it a disaster zone. The buck's cage is destroyed. There's no sign of the crew. Oh, no. There they are. It's implied the buck is the one responsible for all the damage on the boat and the deaths of the crew, despite the fact that some of them were in places he shouldn't have been able to reach. Originally, there was meant to be a Velociraptor that stowed away on the boat and did most of the damage before being killed and then the buck was able to escape. But that was never really filmed and so now it's just the buck. Malcolm finds a dead crewman with his hand on the cargo bay doors and realises what's happened. Ludlow, still playing catch up, has the great idea of checking the cargo hold for the rest of the crew. Malcolm tries to stop them, but it's too late as the buck erupts from the cargo bay, now free from any restraints. The buck walks free from the ship as Ludlow looks on in horror. Now you're John Hammond. He did say he was going to be there. The buck breaks his way through customs control and looks at San Diego in the distance. Sarah berates the engine staff for not keeping the wrecks properly sedated. Apparently, the two darts Roland used were too much and they had to give it something to counteract the effects, but they went too high. Malcolm asks if Junior was on the boat, but the crewman tells him he was brought back by plane. Sarah has an idea. Grab the baby and lure the buck back to the boat before he kills anyone in the city. Malcolm reluctantly agrees and they question a catatonic Ludlow. Where's the infant? It's in a secured facility, why? Where's the facility? The buck takes a stroll through the neighbourhood, mistaking an outdoor pool for drinking water. He does some breaking and entering, rousing Benjamin in the process, who wakes up to see a goddamn T-Rex in his backyard. He quickly goes to his parents as the buck discovers what chlorine tastes like and takes a shine to the family dog. Benjamin wakes his parents, who bicker about who's the worst parental figure, before realising he's right and seeing the buck chowing down on Fido. Poor puppy. Those negligent assholes should have kept him inside. Revealing that he's a sadistic bastard who never even liked the dog, Benjamin snaps a photo of the moment, angering the buck. The scene cuts there, but there was more filmed where the buck broke through the wall and gave them a sniff. Whether or not he finished the job, I don't know. I'll leave the fate of the negligent animal owners up to your own interpretation. Malcolm and Sarah do some breaking and entering of their own, making their way into Jurassic Park San Diego and finding Junior, once again heavily sedated. A guard tries to stop them, and Malcolm tells him to come ahead as they leave looking for the buck. The buck is full on jacking it through downtown San Diego. Cars crash, streetlights are assaulted, and buses are accosted. That bus was one day away from retirement. The Rex sends a bus into a blockbuster because he wants to be the only dinosaur in town. There's also a blink and you'll miss it poster for a King Lear adaptation starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. The buck harasses some Japanese businessmen who just can't catch a break from this shit. Even David Kep is caught up in the rampage. The buck targets him, disagreeing with the direction the third act has taken and has an early morning snack. Malcolm and Sarah catch up to the buck. I'm gonna go out jacking it in San Diego. They try to wake up Junior, but it's not necessary, as the buck catches his scent in a flipped shot and charges after them. They lead him back to the dock as the polis and animal control arrive. <coughs> LOL. On your way. Junior has woken up and is very talkative while Malcolm tries to find a way through the warehouses. That works. Ian and Sarah run with Junior as the buck follows them into the climax. Ludlow tells InGen Security to shoot the buck, but he wants the baby alive, trying to salvage something from this debacle. He sees Malcolm and Sarah carrying Junior and goes after them, chasing them back onto the ship. He catches up in time to see them both jump overboard. He looks around for the baby as a helicopter appears, searching for the buck. Ludlow hears Junior calling out and realises he's in the cargo hold. He goes down and finds the now unmuzzled Junior. He tries to catch him as the buck shows up. Game over, pal. Now face to face with the buck, Ludlow shites it and tries to run away. The buck catches him, breaking his leg and dropping him on the floor next to Junior. Ludlow tries to limp away, but the buck knocks him over. It's time for Junior to make his first kill. 
Ludlow realises this all too late as Junior pounces on him and the buck looks on with approval. Ian and Sarah climb back onto the boat as the helicopter arrives. Ian pushes the button to close the cargo doors as Sarah loads a track dart into the rifle she just found. The black moment arrives as the engine sniper takes aim at the buck. Sarah is faster though and fires a track dart into his neck, sedating him and saving his life. Malcolm and Sarah collect themselves as the chopper stands down and the cargo doors close, with Junior letting out a final little roar. The resolution shows Malcolm, Sarah and Kelly watching a news report of the ship returning to Isla Sorna. Even Stevie Spielberg is in on it, sitting next to them on the couch. Malcolm and Sarah have passed out and Kelly watches as an interview with John Hammond plays on the news report. Able to get himself out of bed, Hammond makes an impassioned plea to the public and local governments to work together to keep the island safe and undisturbed. In an epilogue, we see the ecosystem of Isla Sorna, with the buck and the doe looking after Junior, the stegosaurus herd passing by, and some… pterosaurs? Where the fuck have they been? Fade out. So that's the synopsis and story structure of The Lost World. The hook, Caffey's attack. The inciting incident, Hammond revealing Site B to Malcolm and Sarah already being there. The first act turning point, InGen's arrival. The midpoint, the destruction of the trailers, Eddie's death and the two groups being stranded. The second act turning point, the escape from the island but the buck being taken captive and the climax, Jack in it in San Diego. It follows the traditional three act structure like the first film did, building momentum and stakes to the conclusion. Now, let's take a look at the rest of it. Similar to the first film, The Lost World deals with the themes of humans trying to gain control over nature, but also takes it further, dealing with the intricacies of human nature. The film pits two main groups against each other with opposing ideals, hunters versus gatherers. One group is on the island to observe and document the dinosaurs, gathering, and the other group to capture and profit from them, hunting. Nature versus exploitation, capitalism versus naturalism. So you went from capitalist to naturalist in just four years, that's... That's Both groups have to work together when their comms are destroyed, partly because of the opposing group's actions, but also because of the dinosaurs, or nature, fighting back. Both of the destructions are set in motion by the actions of the other group. Nick and Sarah releasing the dinosaurs, which causes the InGen team's comms to be destroyed, and the InGen group breaking the baby Rex's leg, which causes Nick to take it back to the trailers, drawing out the parents who destroy them. Chaos Theory Conflict between the groups causes things to go bad, but it's nature that forces their hand, bringing them together for mutual survival. The film also deals with the theme of family, shown in various different characters and relationships during the film. Malcolm and Kelly, Ludlow and Hammond, the Stegos, and, perhaps most poignantly, the Rex parents and Junior. This is perhaps the most pronounced through the Rexes, as, looking at their actions, they are clearly the better parents. Malcolm is distant from Kelly and the film gives him an opportunity to rise and be a better father to her. The Buck and the Doe don't have that problem. They practically tear Sorna upside down looking for Junior. They come looking for his blood and the Buck races back to the boat when he realises Malcolm and Sarah have Junior. The theme of parents and children is perhaps the most prominent theme in the film, with mankind trying to control nature taking a back seat. Which makes sense, as we've seen it before. Despite being a supporting character in the first film, this time around, Malcolm is the protagonist. He's the main character in the second book, despite dying at the events of the first one, saying that rumours of his demise were greatly exaggerated. He was then transferred to a better hospital where doctors upgraded his condition to alive. It's probably 100% due to Jeff Goldblum's portrayal of him in the first film along with Kep's writing. The audience connected with him, his quips, his charm, and now he's back to lead film number two. A little less flirtatious and a little more serious this time. Less daddy, more… dad. He's still a shagger, but he's jaded, traumatised by his experiences in the first film. Archetypally, he's still the lover, and that drives his motivations. He's still got the jester's quips, but they don't hold as much sway over him. He wants nothing to do with Sorna or Hammond's dinosaurs, but as soon as he learns Sarah is there, he follows his heart to rescue her. 
His arc in the film is one of redemption. Redemption for his career, redemption for his livelihood, but also redemption for him as a father and a boyfriend. He wants to go and rescue Sarah, but he needs to be there for her. Not just in Sorna, but also in real life. If you wanted to rescue me from something, why didn't you bail me out of that fundraiser at the museum three weeks ago like you said you would? You know, I have made a career out of waiting for you. He also needs to be a better father to Kelly. He's flaky, unreliable. Kelly wants him to yell at her because he never does anything. She doesn't really want him to shout and rage at her, she just wants him to be a father, to be present. The second Malcolm finds Sarah on the island, he's immediately on edge. He knows how quickly and easily things can go wrong and just wants to get them out as soon as he can. He's nervous, jittery. He forgets how to operate Eddie's radio despite being told and keeps a death grip on Kelly. Cut the umbilical, Dad! All throughout the first half of the film, he could be described as a nervous mess. It's not until the midpoint that the communications are destroyed that he starts to become the hero. Still led by his heart, he rises to the challenge. He stays awake, works with Roland, he patrols the camp before the Rex attack and tries to tell everyone to stay calm when they show up. Although he gets injured again running through the long grass, he tries to be the one to go to the communication centre. He leads the first raptor away from Sarah and Kelly, and when the buck is taken back to San Diego, it's him, along with Sarah, that do what needs to be done to get him back on the ship. He gets his redemption for his career and his livelihood, but he also gets his redemption with them. The final scene in the film shows them together, stronger as a family, going into the future. There's a deleted scene that was filmed just before the Rex has come looking for Sarah's shirt, where Kelly asks Malcolm if she's going to marry her. She tells him he should. It's not in the film, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Don't you just love it when these films set up things that they ultimately drop? Sarah encapsulates the explorer. She wants to push the boundaries of what humans know about dinosaurs. She's curious and driven in her goal to prove that dinosaurs are good parents, to the point that she doesn't even care about her own safety. She's reckless, and at times, a bit hypocritical, saying that the group needs to minimise their presence while taking the opportunity to touch a cute stegosaurus. While writing this, I initially thought her character to be a victim of inconsistent characterization in service of the plot, breaking her own rules so that we could get a cute dinosaur moment with the baby stego, and straight up forgetting her own knowledge about predators when it came to the bloodied shirt because the Rexes needed to find the group again. Tyrannosaurus got the largest proportional olfactory cavity of any creature in the fossil record with the exception of one. No! It wasn't until I reconsulted character archetypes that I noticed another word sticking out among the explorer archetype. Unreliable. Not as a negative, but just as a facet of the characterization. Unreliable in her own rules because she follows her heart. Not just because, my own cynicism thwarted, we could get an oh look at the dino moment. As I mentioned before, she's reckless. Unreliable when caring about her own safety, and this comes back to bite her when the Rexes destroy the trailer and she finds herself facing her worst fear. Heights. She would have died when the glass broke if it hadn't been for Malcolm and her lucky pack. From this point on, she's off kilter. Her mind isn't working the way it should. She's exhausted, sleep deprived, and she becomes unreliable in her own knowledge, not realising that the blood that won't dry will draw the buck and the doe to the camp. It's actually consistent with the character's archetype. It remains subjective and open to interpretation, but this is the one I choose to have given her characterization. Perhaps a better way to have the Rexes find the group again would be to have Nick be the one to get Junior's blood on him. He could have stashed the shirt in a bag, setting up the Chekhov's gun of the blood without Sarah seeing, and then hung it up to dry later. Although this would have meant that the Rexes would have gone after him instead and the whole scene would have been different. But I digress. Although flawed, I think the blood on Sarah's shirt works. Throughout the rest of the island, her wits manage to keep her alive, using her intelligence to outwit the raptors. And once on the mainland, she puts what she's learned about the Rexes into practice, being the one who comes up with the idea of using the baby to draw the buck back to the boat, wiser from her experiences on the island. Hammond is once again the herald to the events in the film, as well as the creator. He only has two scenes this time around, but his presence is still impactful, and we catch him at the end of an arc that is a natural progression from where he was at the end of the last film. He's gone from sorrowful regret to optimistic determination about the fate of his creations, arguing that they should be left in peace. Once everything is out in the open again, he finds the strength to make a televised appearance, however brief it may be. The safety of his creations gives him strength in the resolution of the film. Ludlow functions as the film's antagonist, the shadow to Hammond and Malcolm. While Malcolm seeks to save his family, Ludlow casts his aside. 
Despite being John's own family, he has views completely different to Hammond's, wanting to exploit the dinosaurs in order to recoup InGen's financial losses over the last four years. He's a ruthless businessman, willing to oust his own uncle and take control of the company in order to get his way. He wants to be Hammond, or the version of Hammond that he thinks should have existed, but he's inadequate. He tries to set up camp in the middle of a game trail, gets drunk constantly, and is entirely reliant on Roland to lead his group to safety after the midpoint. He even abandons them in the second Rex attack, probably his smartest move considering he survives. He will never be Hammond, as Malcolm tells him. You know, if you try to sound like Hammond, it just comes off like a hustle. But his inadequacy drives him. He sees the buck as a golden ticket when Roland sedates it, ordering the baby to be captured again. He brings them back to San Diego, but he's unable to contain the buck, losing control and, ironically, being the closest he will ever be to his uncle in this moment. From that point on, he's catatonic, until in his panic he tells him to shoot the buck while still thinking he can make something from the baby. His delusions lead to his death in the cargo hold. His death is a complete role reversal and a cathartic, poetic revenge to the way he treated Junior in a deleted scene, but unfortunately, I can't really include it as it was cut from the film. Again, I wish it had stayed. Nick embodies traits from the ally, the trickster and the outlaw an ally to Malcolm's group and a trickster to InGen's. He's an outlaw, working for Greenpeace and against a man, but also cynical. He's in it for the paycheck. That is, until he sees that the dinosaurs are real. From that point, he's committed to the safety of the animals, doing whatever it takes to achieve that goal. He sabotages the camp and Roland's gun. Unfortunately, he ultimately fails, as although he saves the Rexes from being killed, it instead leads to the buck being captured. Many people blame Nick for the events in the film and the subsequent deaths. After all, it's him who sets the dinosaurs free, which destroys the InGen camp. He's the one who takes Junior, which destroys their own camp. And he takes the bullets from Roland's gun, leading to the deaths from the Raptors and the buck being taken back to San Diego. I think this is wrong though. Nick's actions aren't to blame for the events of the film, it's cause and effect. He's forced to free the dinosaurs and take Junior back because of the InGen group's actions. He takes Roland's bullets to stop him from killing something for his own motives. Each decision causes a whole spiralling cascade of events to come from it. A slight detail altering the path of what comes next, or chaos theory. Is Nick an agent of chaos? No, he's ultimately just an ally trying to do what's right. Eddie is the caregiver. Yes, he's a sarcastic, witty and grouchy guy, but he also provides all the tech for Malcolm's group. He literally gives care to Ian, Sarah and Nick after the Rex attack and makes the ultimate sacrifice for them. He's selfless, loyal and a stand-up guy. He's based off of the character Forn in the book, who has an assistant called Eddie Carr who basically becomes the Nick character in the film, except he's not his assistant. It's not really relevant, but it is interesting to see how they adapted the characters from the book to the film. Also, book Eddie gets killed by Velociraptors and the foreign character survives. There's not much else to say, which is a shame because he's one of my favourite characters in the film. Except maybe... press F for Eddie? Kelly once again represents the innocent child in the film, the ultimate cost and worst case scenario for Malcolm, losing his daughter as well as his girlfriend. She does have a journey to go on in the film though. She wants to connect more with her dad. Initially rejected by him, she stows away and becomes entangled in the events on Isla Sorna. She doesn't really have her own personal arc to go on though, she's more connected with Malcolm's. She does have a moment to shine where she saves him from the Velociraptor, but it's not really got the same impact as Lex turning the systems back on in the first film. She may also be an unreliable narrator as her gymnastic skills are clearly good and perhaps she lied to Malcolm about being cut from the team as a ploy to make him feel guilty and spend more time with her. That's just a theory though, as it's never confirmed either way. She does regret her actions pretty quickly once shit gets real with the Rexes, realising that coming along was a terrible idea. I also mentioned the deleted scene where she tells Malcolm he should marry Sarah. She wants them to be a family, and that's implied throughout the film. Her and Sarah have a connection, even if that connection is mostly ganging up on Malcolm. It's Sarah that Kelly sleeps with in the tent, showing their trust. It's this family dynamic that Kelly wants, and by the end of the film she gets her wish. Maybe. I mean, her and Sarah are literally never mentioned in Dominion. Dieter, of course, is a henchman, Roland's second in command and a minor antagonist. He's an asshole and is abusive towards the dinosaurs. He doesn't need a deeper meaning behind his character, as traditionally, he's one of the minor bosses you fight before you'd get to the final boss. He does have his own ironic journey to go on, 
thinking he's superior and more powerful than the compies, he wants to give them something to fear. To be feared. Ultimately, they give him something to fear and he gets his comeuppance in a particularly gruesome way. And that brings us to Roland Tembo, perhaps the most complex character in the whole film. Roland Tembo is uh, like the last of the philosopher hunters, really. He's a hunter, survivor and a gentleman. Although he's in the opposing team and has sinister motives, he's not an antagonist. He's a bit of an anti-hero, but archetypally, he's the sage, the one the rest of the characters turn to for help when things go bad. When we meet him in the film, he has one goal in mind, to bring down the buck. Why? He sees the buck as the greater predator, with humans being second best. He sees it as the ultimate prey, and if he takes it down, he'll be number one and his dick will grow bigger. Toxic masculinity jokes aside though, there is more to his character. In the deleted scene where we meet him, he's jaded. He respects the animals he hunts. True hunter doesn't mind if the animal wins. He wishes more had won against him. But there were not enough escapes from you and me, RJ. We were a firing squad, don't you think? He also has a sense of honour, stepping in to defend an African woman being harassed by Americans and thoroughly brutalising them in the process. We don't get this backstory in the film though. Instead, we get Roland at the point of determination. His arc still comes through in the final film. Although Nick steals his bullets, possibly emasculating him, he is still able to prove himself over the buck by bringing it down, but not killing it. However, he loses the only thing he really cares about, his friend Ajay. He won, but he lost more, and realises it isn't worth it. He chooses to walk away, losing to the animals and nature. His decision probably saves his life. His exit also coincides with the traditional death of the sage or mentor, usually around the second act turning point. His arc has a similar conclusion in the original draft where, after Ajay's death, he and Ludlow track the buck one last time on the island while awaiting rescue. The buck gets the drop on them and Roland concedes, admitting the animal won. Ludlow still tries to shoot it and meets the same fate in both drafts, being carried back to the nest in this one as biting practice for Junior. There are some bits about the dialogue in The Lost World that I really like, and some bits that I'm not so hot on. There are some really good lines in the film. I love the banter between Malcolm and Eddie, particularly Eddie's sarcastic frustration at Malcolm's ineptitude in the first half of the film. Violence and technology, not good bedfellows. Personally, I would have squeezed just a little bit harder. Roland gets some good lines. Oh, you're breaking our hearts. Saddle up, let's get this movable feast underway. I believe I've spent enough time in the company of death. And then there are lines that feel slightly forced. Every egg clutch I've seen has got shells crushed and trampled. The hatchlings definitely stay in the birth environment for an extended period of time. That's conclusive. Exposition dumps don't feel as clean, although they do still serve their purpose and move the plot forward. They just feel more... wordy. I pointed out in the last film that the characters talk the way people normally would speak, but I can't say the same about this one. Kelly in particular talks of a maturity that isn't present in a lot of 12 year olds. Yeah, but I want you to crack on me a little bit, ground me or something, send me to my room. You never do any of that stuff. She says exactly what she wants from Malcolm, but in real life people don't always say what they mean. Maybe there are some 12 year olds that break this rule, but on the whole, even adults don't say what they really mean all the time. They usually argue about something insignificant, something that shouldn't have led to an argument but does because of something else boiling underneath, something that the audience can usually see and is aware of. Dialogue is usually more subtle. Roland's introduction in the film begins with a big monologue, and it's cool, but if you really look at it, he's basically laying out terms that he would already have laid out earlier. It feels like he's telling Ludlow his contract agreements after he's on the island. It's a lot of exposition, and it's doing a lot of heavy lifting. It's introducing his character and setting up his motivations, as well as his relationship with Ludlow. It does its job, but it feels a little rushed, and perhaps could have been handled differently, dropping hints about Roland's motivations and leadership as the film went on, rather than just dropping them all at once. Postlethwaite's performance elevates the dialogue, and on the whole, both he and Kep do a good job with the character, it's just not great. Or perhaps, a better word, realistic. Some leeway can be given as it's a film about genetically cloned dinosaurs brought back to life, but a standard was set with the first film and unfortunately, this one doesn't quite match it. There are, however, a lot of good standalone lines, even though they come across as trailer fodder. Oh yeah, ooh, ah, that's how it always starts. But then later there's running and, and screaming. Mommy's very angry. 
I feel like I'm coming across quite harsh on the dialogue of this film, but I don't hate it. I just feel that it could have been better in a few places. The sequel to the movie that's made nearly a billion dollars worldwide. So can The Lost World live up to its Jurassic Park predecessor? Amy Powell found the answers in the stars. The Lost World had its premiere on the 19th of May 1997, releasing theatrically four days later on the 23rd, and had the biggest release recorded for a film to that date. The hype was real for this one. T -Rex, T -Rex, T -Rex. It had the biggest opening weekend recorded until the release of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone and ended its run with over $600 million worldwide. Less than the first film, but still very impressive for the time. Reviews were mixed, and for those that care, it holds a 54% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes. The audience score was a B+. Reviewers criticised the human characterizations, but praised the visual effects once again. Many were less than hot on the third act rampage, describing it as a Godzilla ripoff. Malcolm, Attenborough and Possilthwaite received commendation for their performances, with some noting better character development from the first film. None of that really held the film back. The fans were there, so was the Dinomania, and also the merchandising. Merchandising! where the real money from the movie is made. There were whole new lines of toys to captivate children based on the film. Something has survived. Look for the mark of Jurassic Park figures and vehicles each sold separately. The film was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Visual Effects again, but this time it didn't win, losing instead to Independence Day. John Williams returned to do the score, creating new themes for the film. They're not as memorable or get used as much as the original film's score, but like anything John Williams, they're still bangers. More drums are incorporated into the score this time, emphasising the wildness of Sorna and the locations. There's a general rule when it comes to sequels. Audiences and the studio want the same, but different. It's a bit of a contradiction, but basically it means they want the same experience, just in a different package. The Lost World strived to present the same dinosaur adventure movie, but this time, it was different. It's not an island where we lose control and the dinosaurs escape. They already have before the film begins. This isn't them taking over. We're going into their territory. It's their world. I'm sorry. The same sense of adventure is there, but this time it's bigger, grander. We're not running through new high-tech facilities, but climbing through decayed, ruined ones. The Lost World brought that sense of adventure in spades, and audiences, please excuse the pun, ate it up. It wasn't as financially successful or groundbreaking as the first film, but how could it be? The same lightning in a bottle effect of Jurassic Park couldn't be replicated. We had already seen the dinosaurs, so now it was time to unleash them, to see what they could do. There was some ground broken with the visual effects though. The animatronics by Stan Winston went a step beyond, able to interact more with the characters in the environment. When you see the buck rip Eddie out of the car, it really did. That's Richard Schiff being hauled out by the animatronic. They were able to do more, particularly with the buck animatronic. It wasn't just the adult ones either. The Baby Rex is a fully real, remote-controlled animatronic that Steven Spielberg described as Stan Winston's masterpiece. Regardless of any views on the quality of the film, consideration has to be given to the craftsmanship on display. As it has aged, reviews have still been mostly mixed, with some loving it and others considering it an inferior sequel that focused on action over story and is one of Spielberg's more inferior films. There is still a generation of 90s kids who love the film and it is still with them today. The film was, without question, one of, if not the biggest event in my childhood. I know that's probably a bit sad to say, but this film was an event for me. I had heard of a sequel a few years before, and by the time it came out, the hype was more than real. I had the posters, I had the tie-in comics, I had the junior novelization, I even had bubble bath that came in a Rex-shaped container that you could use as a toy once it ran out. I even had the bull T-Rex toy that my dad bought for me as a gift while we were on a trip to America, which was my pride and joy, as well as a completely legitimate copy of the film that he sent from overseas. The wait for that was the longest wait of my life. I even got a PlayStation on Christmas 1997 complete with the Lost World PS1 tie-in game. Unfortunately, over the years, some of these things have disappeared due to events outside of my control, but I have been able to hold on to the Jurassic Park and Lost World double set that my grandmother got me for Christmas one year. Oh, 
mean, just fucking check these things out. So cool. Childhood relics aside, I loved this film. And, to be honest, I still do today. As I've gotten older, I've started to see some of the flaws, and maybe some of it is nostalgia, but this film still has a hold over me. However, I do see the issues with it. The film suffers considerably from several of the deleted scenes that I've mentioned being left on the cutting room floor. I think they set out with a vision of what the perfect sequel could be, and along the way it got crushed under its own might and they had to let some things go. The animatronics are a step up, but I can't deny that at certain times they look a little stiff, like they're lacking movement in some areas. This compi isn't even doing anything. The dialogue is hokey, and the reasoning for certain events in the film, i.e. the Rexes finding the group before the long grass sequence, could have been better. Speaking of the long grass, while that scene feels borderline perfect, minus the missing death of Ajay, it does feel like the raptors get a little bit shortchanged in this film. They don't have as much of a presence or screen time this time around, appearing in the film only for a couple of brief sequences. Although they rack up a pretty significant body count, they feel kind of gimmicky. They're jumping around all over the place and get outsmarted. One of them even gets killed by a child. You could say they're a little bit nerfed when it comes to fighting our heroes as opposed to hunting the InGen group. While the San Diego sequence does feel a bit like another film tacked on at the end of the one we've been watching, I do still like it. It advances the story, with InGen having been thwarted and the public knowing about the islands, opening the franchise up to future possibilities. The ending of the original draft had the island still remaining a secret, which I feel would have been the inferior ending. The whole point of Malcolm's group is to reveal the existence of the dinosaurs to the public, which didn't happen in that version. Despite everything, this still advances the overall story. Objectively, The Lost World is a flawed follow-up to Jurassic Park that tries its best to bring the frills and adventure in a new package, but unfortunately suffers from events and characters that don't quite reach their full potential. Subjectively, it's a hell of a lot of fun. I'd give The Lost World Jurassic Park four stars out of five, with a smirking Eddie sign of approval. If you feel just that qualified at all, you might try flicking the switch to on. So that's my screenplay and story analysis of The Lost World Jurassic Park. And if you live in the UK, you can watch The Lost World on Sky Movies or Now TV. You can rent it from a whole bunch of online retailers, or once again, you can just buy it, which is the superior option. Do you agree with my analysis? Let me know in the comments down below, along with any other films or screenplays that you'd like me to add to the ever-growing list. If you like what you've seen, please hit like and subscribe to the channel as it helps. If you didn't like it, well, subscribe anyway so that you can hate watch the next shit I put out. We'll be taking a break from dinosaurs for a bit and going to another galaxy for the next one. Once again, thank you for watching. I've been Stumo, and remember, let your dog sleep inside. You never know when some T-Rex is going to come jacking it for your neighbourhood. <laughs>